1956, uh, when John McCarthy coined the term artificial intelligence. And not soon after that, it gained traction uh, in the industry. Actually, uh, even in the 60s, people have been worrying about AI is taking jobs from us. Uh, but not soon after that, uh, people realized a lot of the promises made by AI was overpromise. And that's, uh, there's, that's the first, uh, there's that's the first winter of AI in the 80s. Uh, in the 70s and in the 80s. And then again, once again, in the 80s, uh, uh, AI gained traction again uh, due to the development of what's known as expert systems. But once again, a lot of the promises made by AI was not met. Uh, and uh, after that, they went to the second uh, AI winter. So that still is until, uh, until the rise of the, the most recent uh, AI hype. That's uh, starting around uh, 2000, 2010. Uh, due to the development of uh, technology known as deep learning. So, so nowadays we are in the high point of the AI hub. Uh, so we see a, a very large growth in AI number of AI companies and the, num the amount of money that got put into the AI industry. Uh, once again, people are starting to talk about I'm trying to yeah, once again, people start to worry about, uh, so there are quotations from Elon Musk, that robots will be able to do everything better than us. People start to worry about that AI will take over jobs and AI will, AI will do everything people can do nowadays. Uh, and there is a fast growth of uh, both researches and the number of patents over the years, just in recent years. Um, it seems that the promises uh, that has been made in the past are closer to come true now because some of the promises, such as uh, some of the hard problems, such as face recognition, speech recognition, uh, the current AI systems can do better than human level nowadays, uh, seems getting even closer to, uh, to surpass human intelligence. Uh, but is that the truth? Uh, are we expecting too much of AI? And where are we now? What, what can technologies can do? Where are the limitations? So let's look at some of the hottest areas uh, in, the, in the past few years. The first one is the first one is uh, autonomous driving. So in 2000, 2012, Sergey Brin from Google said that you can count on one hand that the number of years it take before ordinary people can experience a self-driving car. And in 2016, Elon Musk said he said he thinks autonomous driving is a solved problem, and we're probably two years away. And now we are in the year of 2019. Uh, what's the reality now? Well, more and more people think that the prediction that has been made in the past were wrong, and self-driving cars seems to be further than, uh, than ever. It has, still has a long way to go. So why is this so hard? I mean, in other segments of the transportation industry, if you look at trains or subways and even airplanes, they have reached a much higher autonomy level than cars. But why is it so hard to achieve uh, autonomous driving? Well, if you look at trains, it's operating in a closed system. It, it runs on tracks, but if you look at self-driving car, it has to deal with unpredictable, varied environment. Uh, for example, there could be kids running out from the street. It could, it could deal with different uh, weather conditions, and the, the tracks may not be marked clearly. So all this makes autonomous driving very hard. So the difference is operating in an open environment versus a closed environment. The so same issues were faced by other uh, areas, such as service robot. Uh, those are pictures I got from the news, uh, like security robot, uh, knocks down a toddler, uh, a, a pe pepper from the uh, SoftBank robotics. They got fired because of uh, people in the grocery store doesn't like them. So uh, same thing happened because those environments are, uh, are also open space, like shopping malls and grocery stores. It's much harder to predict what's going to happen. And here is a yet another industry that's having a very tough year, uh, tough year over the past year. Uh, and this one is actually quite related to us. It's, uh, it's a social robot industry. Quite a few companies uh, shut down their services over the past years. And actually, a lot of them are, uh, are famous star companies. They got a lot of money from either from crowdsource uh, source funding or from venture capital funding. And this, uh, unlike the other, uh, the autonomous driving industry, uh, 
for the social robot, they actually deliver uh, products to the end customers. And the reason is, and I actually I have owned quite a few of these, and it's, it's quite fascinating just to look them moving around and see how, how, how they work. Uh, but the problem is, uh, after a few days, most people realize that the actual functionality of these robots are no more than a, a voice assistant. And you can get a voice assistant from uh, Amazon Echo or Google Home uh, or in China, even cheaper from Tmall, uh, for less than $50. But a lot of these robots cost close to $1,000, but the functionality is unclear to the end customer. So one lesson we learned from this is you cannot sell by adorable, adorableness alone. Although they are cute, they are adorable, uh, but it's hard to get customers pay just for those. So to be a real companion has to be useful for something. So why is it so hard to bring AI to real life? Well, I think there are two reasons. One is the technology. Uh, the other is uh, trying to find the good use case uh, with the current technology. So if we look at the current technology, which is, uh, uh, which is largely, uh, the current rise of AI is largely due to a technology known as deep learning. And there are quite a few problems with deep learning, and these are often listed in research papers and in the news. Uh, first one is explainability. I mean, even, even the best researchers in deep learning, they, they don't know all the details of why a model works and why it doesn't work. Sometimes a slight change of a hyperparameter, hyperparameter could break everything. Um, so that poses a lot of problem if you want to replace, completely replace human, uh, human workers with a system that's almost a black box. And another problem that's even worse is the bias of algorithm because uh, it's, it's a technology that depends largely on the, on the data. Uh, it's also biased by the training data we used when we develop those algorithms. So it's, this is an example where sometimes when you train a network on some data and deploy it in real world, even a slight change of maybe different type of noise could cause your neural network to make uh, totally stupid uh, predictions in this case. And other problem is also related to the data, the demand for large amount of data, such as data scarcity and the privacy and security. I mean, uh, the success of deep learning depends on um, training on a large batch of labeled data, but in reality, it's often hard to get such data. For example, for when we developed the vacuum cleaner, one of the features we want is to avoid maybe uh, dog poops, uh, animal waste, and we want to recognize and go around it, but it's actually, it turns out to be extremely difficult to get that data. And it's a, a lot of that, uh, variety uh, in terms of different type of dogs and so on. So uh, that's a real world problem. I mean, in principle, it should be able to be solved by technologies like deep learning, but in reality, it turns out to be really, really difficult. Um, personally, I have a background in neuroscience, and uh, before studying Anglebot, I actually worked for three years for a company called Numenta in the Valley. Uh, where we're working on uh, trying to decipher the principles of the brain. So if we compare the artificial neural networks we use nowadays to the principles uh, in actual biological neural systems, we see quite a few differences. Uh, for neural networks, they typically get trained with large amount of data in a parallel fashion. Uh, where brains, they are continuously learning from, uh, from, from streams of sensory input. We don't have batch learning. Uh, and also, uh, we, we don't, it's not like deep learning where training and inference are completely separated from each other. Brains never stop learning. I mean, there are processes known as synaptic genesis and synaptic plasticity going on that's uh, between, the, uh, between neurons in our brain. And because of this uh, difference of learning paradigm, uh, deep learning tends to have poor generalization on data from different domain. Here about bio domain, I just mean data uh, problems with a maybe a slight different uh, statistical structure, could be a different type of noise, uh, could be something else, but our brains are much more robust uh, to those uh, things, to those noises. And there are uh, many other differences as, as well. Uh, so the point here is uh, the current deep learning uh, networks, they have quite a, quite a lot of limitations. Um, and when we think about applications we can develop using current technology, uh, 
So here is a, a, a comparison. Uh, they typically work well on problems such as speech recognition, face recognition, which can be very well defined with a large amount of labeled data. And the problem itself is statistically stationary. Uh, faces don't change all the time, speeches don't change all the time. Uh, but in real world, you have to deal with an uh, environment like this. For us, we develop home robots, and each home has a different layout. Um, there are different clutters, and even for different kids, they have different behavior, and we have to deal with interference with pets and with kids and so on. So that's, that's what all makes it really hard to bring AI to real life. So uh, one way to look at the domain of different AI applications, uh, here I laid out two dimensions. One is the technology readiness level on the horizontal axis, and the other is the usefulness and the value it brings to the customer or to the end user. Uh, for example, for autonomous driving, uh, for delivery robots that can deliver to your doorstep, they are quite useful, but the technology is, uh, is quite far away from mature, it's not there yet. Uh, so uh, it's, hard, it's really hard for startups to work on those domains because we have limited resources. On the uh, lower right side, we have like, applications that can deliver to the uh, end user, like uh, uh, Anki, Cosmo, the Kuri, uh, Jibo, and those robots. They actually got delivered, and they, some of the customers actually like them. But turns out in the long term, it's just not useful enough to justify their value. Or simply, they are just too expensive for their usefulness. So we decided to work on the upper right corner uh, where there is a very uh, well-defined problem and, and clear value in those problems, such as uh, mowing a lawn or maybe cleaning a house. Um, and also the technology is, um, uh, can, uh, uh, the technology is ready for those applications. And also, um, another reason to decide to work on the home environment is, uh, I think for an AI company to, to succeed, we need to build a positive uh, feedback loop between the application scenario uh, and the data and the algorithm. So uh, the, more you, 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 the more data you get, typically you have better algorithms, but to get that, Working, you need to first have a good product delivered to the market and gain traction uh, with customers, which means you need to bring value to the customer. So uh, we choose uh, to work on the home environment because uh, it's simply because that's where we spend most of our time in. Um, and actually, over the past years, a lot of the devices in the IoT space has fighting has been trying to uh, fighting for to be the center of the IoT. Uh, there had, uh, I mean, in the past, there, there are smart routers, smart speakers, and more recently, there are smart TVs, uh, which try to become the center of the attention in the, in the thing. And we think uh, the robot is uh, quite unique in this uh, space because it's uh, almost the only, uh, the only device in your home that can naturally move the ground and for a good reason, because it needs to clean every corner of your house. And by doing that, it actually uh, can have a comprehensive understanding of your home environment. And uh, the, the value in that information is, is valuable not only for, for it to finish its cleaning task, but also to, uh, it's also useful for some other IoT devices. I mean, uh, for each of the IoT devices, uh, they can have much more value if they know their spatial location and purpose in the home. So that's why we picked the uh, vacuum cleaner robot as the first uh, entry point. Uh, Although it seems at first that vacuum cleaner robot is a much easier problem to deal with than, than autonomous driving cars, but it turns out that the technology behind this behind the robot is quite complicated. So those are five areas at least here, uh, which are some of the core technologies we developed over the years. The first one is localization and mapping, which means you, for a robot to operate and finish a cleaning task successfully, it needs to know its location and it, it needs to build a map as it works around in the environment. And this is almost a chicken and egg problem. I mean, for typical mapping system, uh, localization system like the GPS, we, we need to know the, uh, the, the location of the satellite in advance. But in this case, we don't have satellites. We have to, uh, we have to uh, generate three-dimensional landmarks as we navigate in the space you know, using a technology called simultaneous localization and mapping. And localization is, is one is a, a big part, but it's, not, it's by itself is not enough. It also needs to have a good perception. It's, it needs to know the different type of obstacles, 
what kind of thing they should avoid, what kind of thing they sh should try to push into, uh, and so on. Uh, and also to have a really good, to build a really smart uh, robot, people tend to want to have interaction features such as speech control, gesture control, and so on. Um, each of them, they have some support in the, uh, in the academia. For example, for localization and mapping, people, people have been studying this for years. And they actually got first used in, uh, in submarines for it to locate underwater uh, or on Mars rover when there is no satellite but it still needs to localize. Uh, but in research papers, what people tend to focus on is a performance on some certain benchmark data set, typically captured either on the highway or in a very well-defined hallway. Um, and here people care about the accuracy, the latency, and so on. There are a list of criteria people care about, but it turns out in real life, none of that actually matters. Because what, what, what we really need is a, a super robust system, because uh, we need to navigate in an environment like the right. There are uh, cluttered uh, obstacles, there are uh, occlusion due to furniture and interference uh, by our pets and by humans. So to give you a sense of feeling of what kind of data we, we have to work with, here is a, a, a simple movie taken from the eye of the robot. As you can see, there are very fast rotational motion, uh, interference of human, changing of light conditions, occlusion. This is when it runs under, under a, a desk or sofa. Uh, so a lot of the, the things, they are not captured in, in any of the benchmark data set, but that's a, the real uh, challenge we have to deal with is to make the robot actually work. Uh, and to make it even worse, we have to work with a very super low cost embedded system that has very limited computing power because we are talking about consumer electronics product which are very cost sensitive. So uh, those are some of the sensors we have in, the, in our latest uh, robot. And uh, because the current algorithms are not smart enough, uh, we need to make sure that the robot is robust using a combination of uh, different type of sensors. For example, we have a panoramic camera mounted on top of the robot, which gives it uh, the widest view it can possibly have. Uh, we have a three-dimensional time of flight depth camera mounted in the front for it to sense different obstacles and uh, go around it. And also on the bottom of the robot, we have an optical flow tracking sensor, uh, cliff sensors, odometers, and inside it, we have the inertia measurement unit to tell, tell the robot uh, its pose in the environment. Um, so the sensors are out there, but it takes a lot of algorithm to uh, glue them together. Uh, and that's how we build a, start to build a robust uh, localization and mapping system in the first place. So uh, after the localization and mapping, the second problem we have to deal with is the perception. Uh, so in this case, we use uh, both deep learning and uh, uh, traditional, uh, traditional machine learning algorithm to detect, uh, to recognize and detect objects in the environment so that it knows which one it should go around and which one it should turn away uh, and which one it can go into it, like uh, the bottom of the sofa it can go into it. And on the right, is, this is using the three-dimensional time-of-flight camera uh, to, using a technology called three-dimensional object detection to not only know the uh, presence of an obstacle, but also to know the exact uh, distance to it so that we can avoid it precisely. And combining these technologies together, we actually can uh, extract some very interesting information. This is interesting not only for the robot to finish its cleaning task, but also for other IoT devices as well. So we can build three-dimensional indoor models using the SLAM technology and combining the ability to recognize objects, we can put different objects on the map to generate a semantic map for a smart 2D navigation. And also you can imagine this map can be shared with other IoT devices to let them know where their location are in their home. Uh, this is a, another interesting technology we have uh, built into uh, the robot. Um, so this is a, a video clip taken from the 360-degree fisheye panoramic camera. And you can see that it can, it's able to detect the faces, uh, uh, tracking, tracking hands, and detect the behavior of a, of a, of a, a customer in this case. OK, so I do not have time to go through all the technology in the past. Uh, but the reason we 
uh, we, we think uh, this is an interesting segment to work in is because uh, we believe this actually has the potential to become a, a key member in the coming era of the artificial uh, intelligent, uh, what's called AIoT domain, uh, because of its uh, its nature, uh, it's uh, because of the ability to move around in the home and the mapping information that collects as it works. So, um, yeah, just to sum up, I think uh, the challenge is, uh, is here is not just about technology. I mean, technology is never the rocket itself, it's a fuel to the rocket. And it's about to finding out the right application uh, that can bring a real value to the customer. So we choose to start with a, a somewhat low-key application. It's just a vacuum cleaner robot. It's not a fancy autonomous driving car, but we think that's a good entry point to, to, the, uh, to smart home. And it's actually, I think it has the potential to become a key member of it in the future. Thank you. Thank you so much, Danny. That's very inspiring. And we're definitely going to talk um, more about the, the stories behind and the technology um, in our panel later. So our next speaker 